vibrations, okay? Because vibrations can ruin everything. You know, if you want something to move to a certain place, and you want to do so precisely and accurately, it doesn't help if it's shaking to death, okay? So what you can do is, um, you know, everything after the first natural frequency from here on to the right, okay, is, is, um, is kind of trash. You don't want to be driving your system with frequencies above at or above the first natural frequency. Okay, you want to be driving things within the bandwidth, which is shown by this red line, essentially, in kind of a crude way. Everything before that is essentially one-to-one. -one. If you give it an input, it, it'll do the same thing in the output, okay, where its gain is one. Okay, so if you want to increase the bandwidth, in other words, be able to drive the system at faster and faster speeds from anything from zero speed quasi-static to... Um, you know, fast speed, right, um, then you want to increase the first natural frequency. And to do that, you want to stiffen your flexures, increase K, and reduce the mass, decrease M. So you'll often see with flexure stages, they hog out the stage, they get rid of as much mass as possible, and they try and stiffen the flexures. So it's a little mass with a lot of stiffness. If you do that, then you have high first natural frequency, and as a result, all your other natural frequencies and mode shapes won't even be accessed, and you can drive your stage, your system, over a large bandwidth and have no problems with vibration. Okay? So that's principle number one. Increase the first natural frequency, and it'll help improve your system largely. Okay? Another thing is avoid aligning mode shape directions with sensitive directions. So say this little blue dot is an atom, and say we have a stage here that's much larger than this, of course, and, and it's supposed to like push this atom and move it. Okay, that, that's a really ambitious thing, to grab and push an atom. Or say this is a little bit larger than an atom, but, but it's, it's still really small, right? Well, what if you've designed flexures on this stage so that it's, it's got a sensitive vibration direction where it's prone to vibrate in this direction? Well, that's no good because you're trying to push it in this direction and it'll knock it and then pull it back and knock it and pull it back. You know, that's no good. So if you have to have a sensitive direction of vibration in this application, it'd be better to align it in this direction. So say it has to freak out in this direction. You'd rather do that than this because you're trying to push the thing in this direction. So if you have uh, an unacceptable sensitive direction of vibration that you can do nothing about, just make sure it doesn't al that it's aligned in a way that it's not as dangerous to your system, okay? Okay, that's another principle. Another principle is damping, okay? You can always damp vibrations, okay? And there's many ways to damp vibrations, to get rid of them, okay? There's, there's the poor man's way to do it, passively through shearing of, like, fluid. Like, for instance, take your whole flexure stage and drop it in a vat of honey or water. I mean, honey would be even better. The more viscous it is, the more viscous shearing you get uh, with fluid, the more you're going to restrict the flexure's ability to vibrate. Okay? And that's, that's a cheap way to do it. If you can't afford to immerse it in fluid, which often you can't because there's like actuators that have wiring and all that stuff, and it's just not practical to have goopy, um, you know, honey surrounding your flexure, then you can attach like rubber strips on the flexure bearings and those rubber strips will kind of dampen the vibrations. Now watch out because they, they will be, generate some hysteresis and you can reduce some uh, precision, but uh, sometimes you don't need as much precision and you'd, you'd rather get rid of the damping and it's a poor man's way to do it. Um, the expensive way to do it is through active control. This is really the best way to do it, but it's gonna cost you. If you put six actuators and sensors all over a system, um, regardless of how many degrees of freedom it is, say, say you had just a one or two degree of freedom stage, um, if you really want to get rid of all vibrations in all six directions, in all the independent directions, you really need six actuators and sen six sensors usually. Okay, we're going to talk about this. Sometimes you can get away with less. And, and, and sometimes you just need one actuator to control it if there's just one particular direction you care about. Um, but to, you know, the high-end way to get rid of all vibrations um, so it's acceptable for almost any application is put six actuators and six sensors on this guy and um, use active control, which means, you know, sense how it's moving and feed it back with a closed loop control to the actuator so the actuator can uh, get rid of that unwanted motion. Okay, so if you, if you 
through closed loop control with actuators and sensors, close the loop, you can just actively dampen out all vibrations and annihilate them, okay? But it's going to cost you and it's a lot of control and it's a pain. Okay, another approach that doesn't use closed loop control but is also active, so it's a little bit cheaper, is called input shaping, okay? So you can imagine, say you have a stage and if you plot force over time, say you put a constant force on the stage, okay? Well, you know, if it's a stage with a spring on it and everything, some flexure, right, then, then if you put suddenly some step force on it, you're going to see the stage like oscillate like this. And you probably don't want that. You would probably want it to just move right up there. It's these oscillations that's the vibration you don't want. That's the thing killing your system, right? And so, sorry if I drew this horrible. <laughs> so it doesn't look this, this ugly. With os oscillations actually look quite pretty. Um, but but there, you don't want them. Okay, you don't want things oscillating. That's the whole point. You don't want vibrations. Well, say you don't have sensors, so you can't do closed loop control. You can't know what it's doing to feed back to like closed loop control it out. So it has to be open loop control, but you do have an actuator that of course put the force on it, but you want to get rid of this. Well, what you can do is if you characterize the system and you know how it performs, then you can accommodate, you can shape the input. Say you give it a weird force like this, and it ends up responding with the displacement like you want, some nice smooth thing. Okay, now I, I don't know, you know, it depends on the system for how this looks, but that's what input shaping is. You don't have sensors, you don't use closed loop control, it's open loop control, you characterize the system, give it a weird force that, that's shaped, so you can get the displacement you want out and with no vibrations, okay? So that's another way to get rid of vibrations. It's a little, it's midway between active and passive uh, control, right? It's, it's like open loop, cheaper than, than active, but uh, more expensive than just passive dumping in honey or something, okay? But uh, vibrations can be bad, okay? So be, be prepared to deal with them. Okay, so another thing that you need to know is how do you, um, how do you uh, select material for flexures? The, you know, flexures are made of material and material affects their behavior. So what to use and what not to use is the purpose of this slide. Okay, so, um, right, so, so um, I told you stay away from polymers and avoid high temperatures. So polymers almost inevitably, elastomers, these things, they, they, they creep. They, they, they have time-dependent viscoelastic behaviors and they, they generate hysteresis and internal friction. They're bad for precision and they're bad for accuracy. They're bad for all sorts of things. So, and, then, and then, like I said, um, you know, stay away from high temperatures. Even if you use metal, if it's in a really hot circumstance, it's approaching a third to half of its uh, melting temperature, uh, you'll start seeing creep and stress relaxation, okay, which you don't want, okay? Um, so, so keep the flexures as cold as possible, make them out of metal or something, or ceramic can work too, but it's, it's very brittle. So you'll see uh, devastating catastrophic failure if, if, you accident, if you come too close to the yielding point. But ceramics can be acceptable flexures, okay? So um, Rare though, that they'll they barely strain before they break. So, but but anyway, so most people use metals. Um, okay, so so th those are some rules of thumb at the top there. But um, this says choose a large yield strength, low modulus material to get a large deflection range. So, look at these plots um, to help you understand why that's the case. Okay, say I had a material that had a high yield strength, meaning you know. It, it, it takes a lot of stress before it starts plastically deforming and, and yielding and moving toward failure. So everything before that, every stress before that, below that is, is elastic, okay? So, so it has a high yield strength, but a low modulus it means the slope of this, if you're plotting stress versus strain, the slope of this is, is small, so it's a shallow line, okay? So, you know, so that's the case where you have a large yield strength, low modulus, okay? Here's a case where you have a high modulus, meaning it's very steep, it's very large slope, but a small yield strength. It doesn't go up very high, okay? So um, if you plot the ratio of yield strength to modulus, you know, and you want a flexure to get a large range. Re remember, one of, the, one of the disadvantages of flexures 
is they, they don't get much range. Other bearings can get infinite range. Flexors are limited in range. So the game is always find out how you can increase the range as much as possible. And material properties can help. And the material property you want to compare is you want to plot yield strength versus Young's modulus of the material and find out which one, you know, make, make a big list of all the materials you have available and, and, and calculate their yield strength versus modulus and put them in the chart. And if you really care about range, you want the one with the largest ratio because think about it, if you have a large yield strength but a small E, small modulus, then think about it, before anything breaks, you'll be able to deform over this entire strain range. But if you have a low yield strength, if it breaks quickly, and it's got a high stiff modulus, which is, which is often the case for ceramics and stuff, that you don't get much range at all. It'll just move a little bit and pow, it'll break and you'll be done. Okay? So if you care about range, you care about this and you pick the largest one. Okay, there are other material property things you care about, like thermal diffusivity versus thermal expansion coefficient. Okay? Thermal diffusivity is basically how quickly the heat can dissipate through the material. Okay? And thermal expansion coefficient, of course, is for a change in temperature, how much does it expand? Okay, so when you're, when you're thinking of thermal issues, you really want to, for all these materials, plot the thermal diffusivity ratio over the thermal expansion. And why would we care about that? Well, think about it. If you have a low thermal diffusivity, but a high thermal expansion, so that this ratio is small, then think about it. If you have... Um, say you have the flexure here, but you've got a heat source over here. So, so this side is preferentially heated hotter than this side. Well, if it's got a huge thermal or a small thermal diffusivity, then this side's going to stay super hot and this side's going to stay super cold and it's not going to distribute the temperature, the heat very well. And so, and then if you also have a large thermal expansion coefficient, then that hot side's going to expand and even if you have designed it so that it's thermally stable, symmetric and everything, it's not going to be thermally stable because this side is going to be way hotter than the other side and it's also going to expand a huge amount and it's going to move in an undesired way. So if you really want, so, so small ratio here is bad. What you really want is a large thermal diffusivity so no matter where the heat source is, it spreads the heat out almost instantaneously like so everything's the same temperature and then you want a really low thermal expansion coefficient so as it heats up that uniform temperature things don't expand much okay so you want a large ratio here for thermal issues okay what about this one this is Young's modulus over density why would you want that to be high well that's those are material properties you know Young's modulus and density are material property those things track the dynamics of the system the vibration issues right Remember for vibration, we want a system with a, remember the natural frequency of a system is the square root of its stiffness divided by its mass. Okay, so if you want to increase the bandwidth of the system so it can tolerate many more frequencies without freaking out, you know, so, so it behaves well, uh, then you want a large stiffness and a small mass. And for material property land, modulus is the stiffness and density, which is mass per volume, is the mass, right? So you want a large stiffness, small mass, so square root K over M for your system, no matter what the design is, is, is pretty large, okay? And then, of course, you want a small cost. So all three of this is, this is a mechanical for range, this is thermal, and this is dynamic, okay? You want all these ratios to be as large as possible, but you want the cost to be small. Now, you can go into MatWeb, which is a great website that almost any material will give you all the material properties, and you can make a giant spreadsheet of like all materials. And the interesting thing is when you do that, uh, guess what material you find is like the best material for a flexure with the largest ratios here at the smallest cost. Well, it, it turns out to be plutonium <laughs> of all things. But of course, you also have to consider that plutonium uh, could kill you, right? It's radioactive and everything. So you probably don't want to use that. Um, but it's interesting. It is by these criteria, the best flexure material. Now, as far as practical use, Aluminum, which is the winner on this cat, like titanium is pretty good, by the way. Titanium is a pretty good flexure material, but aluminum kind of wins the day as far as cost and thermal and dynamic capabilities, okay? So titanium and aluminum are pretty darn good. Um, 
the stainless steel can be good too, you know, and, and invar. These are all, you know, you see flexures made of these materials, okay? But uh, aluminum's cheap, it's machinable as well. Uh, there's, there's other things to consider uh, when you're selecting material for a flexure, okay? Okay, and that brings us to our final point of this introduction, which is flexure fabrication. How do you make compliant mechanisms, okay? Well, there's, there's many ways to do it, okay? Most flexures uh, need to be made um, of, uh, uh, well, actually, this is a good stopping point. My thing's about to run out of battery. Let me turn this off.